Okay, last time we started looking at displacement as the beginning of our study of kinematics. So displacement was the idea that given an object, we can record its position using numbers, especially if it's in one, one spatial dimension. And the displacement is kind of a generaliz generalization of this idea where we take the difference between our ending position and our starting position to give us the displacement or the change in position. So what we did is we looked at some graphs of these things. We looked at um, the position time graphs and how we can interpret these. And we started looking at the idea of velocity. Uh, we looked at the average velocity, which is basically ch a displacement or a change in position over an interval of time. And that's kind of corresponds to our idea of speed that we know about um, from our sort of day-to-day -day experience. So what we want to do this time is to dig a little bit deeper at velocity first, because when our object is moving, it kind of makes sense that it has a velocity at every particular point in time. If you're in your car and you look at the speedo, um, that number changes dynamically as you slow up and you speed down. Slow down, speed up. <laughs> uh, anyway, so we want to sort of make a little more precise the idea of velocity at a particular moment rather than just an average one, which is called the instantaneous velocity. And once we've done that, we want to look at what happens when we change velocities, and this introduces the next level of the next concept up, which is that of acceleration. So that's what we're going to do today. Kia ora koutou. I'm Richard Brown, and I'm one of your lecturers for biophysical principles. Okay, so last time we played with the moving man, if you remember, to draw ourselves some position time graphs. And let's just uh, briefly recap kind of a couple of take key takeaways from that class. So what we've got here are three position time graphs. Um, uh, and the first one, the graph is sloping upwards, so it corresponds to a motion to the right. The second one, it's sloping upwards again, but this time it's steeper, so we'd expect this to also be a motion to the right with a higher magnitude or a higher velocity number. And the second, it's sloping downwards with about the same steepness as the first one, so we'd expect that to be a similar size but negative. Um, while we're here, we should just quickly look at some components of graphs that we usually find um, before we move on. So the variable along the horizontal axis, that's usually called the independent variable. And for most of our problems that we're going to work on, that will be time. But sometimes, especially when you were at school, this will often have been x. But for us, a lot of the time is going to be time along there. Uh, the vertical axis, that contains our dependent variable. Uh, so that's usually the quantity that we're interested in, so displacement or velocity or whatever. Now some key things that need to always be included, you always need to make sure that your axes have labels of what variable they are, and also units, otherwise they can be ambiguous or meaningless even. And finally we need to make sure we have a title that makes some kind of sense in the context you're giving your graph in. Um, yeah, that's about that. So let's just go back to those velocity, uh, those three dis uh, motions that we talked about before. And let's just quickly recap, recap on how to find the average velocities. So for our first graph, we've got t naught is 2, t f, remember that's the finishing time, is 9, x naught, the initial position, is negative 3 meters, and the final position, x f, is 2 meters. So remember, our average velocity calculation, that's just the change in x, or the displacement, over the change in time, which is 2 minus negative 3 meters over 9 minus 2 seconds, which will give us 2 minus negative 3 is 2 plus 3 is 5 divided by 7, which is about 0.71 meters per second. Now for our second graph, we'd expect the number to be a bit larger in magnitude because it's steeper, and we'd also be, expect it to be positive because it's upward. So if we go and do the same calculation again, we'll get our average velocity is 4 minus negative 3 over 7 minus 3, which is 7 over 4, which is about 1.75 meters per second, just using the same calculation method as before. And for our third one, we'd expect the number to be similar in magnitude because it's about as steep as the first, but it's going downwards, so we'd expect to get a negative number. So this time, we've got t naught is 1, tf is 9, x naught is 4, and xf is negative 2. So doing that calculation, we'll get the average velocity is negative 2 minus 4 over 9 minus 1, which will be negative 6 over 8, which will be about negative 0.75 meters per second, which is about similar to 0.71, kind of close to what we expected, that's good. Alright, so when we're doing these sort of rise over run calculations, so remember the rise is the change in position, the change in our vertical variable, and the run is the change in our horizontal position, we're basically taking a right angled triangle like this one, so here's a triangle with a height of 1 and a base of 3, and we're taking its height 
delta x divided by its base distance, delta t, which gives us something like v averages a third. Now what if we just took this triangle and scaled it up to one that was twice as big? Okay, here's one with maybe height of 2 and base of 6. Then if we were to calculate velocity, interpreting that height again as a delta x and the base as a delta t, then the velocity is the same thing. Our average velocity v av would be 2 over 6, which is 1 third again. So what the velocity is really giving us is the slope or the steepness of this triangle. Both these triangles have the same slope down there, and so they give us the same velocity. It doesn't matter how big the triangle is. Okay, so what this does is it gives us a bit of a way of calculating the instantaneous velocity when we look at a graph. So let's just take a, here we have a curved position time graph representing the displacement of some jet car over time. Notice those, the vertical variables in kilometers, probably have to fix that soon, and the horizontal one is in time. So the displacement is increasing and it's curved, so it means it's, it's getting bigger and bigger as time goes on. Okay, so if we want to know the velocity at time around about 42, for example, it's a question we, want, we might want to know. What, what does the speedo say at time 42 seconds? Well, one, one way we could do it is we could take an average velocity um, for some region surrounding 42. So we could take t naught as 30 and we could take tf as 50, draw the line connecting those and then look at the rise of a run, and that would give us a pretty good idea of what that is. Um, but actually what we're going to do is something slightly different we're going to draw a tangent line to the curve. So a tangent line is a line that just touches but doesn't cross our curve at the point that we're interested in. So it kind of sort of butts up against it. Um, so we can draw this tangent line on and extend it kind of as far as we can get away with um, to try and get some reasonable accuracy in our calculation. And then we can calculate velocity based on the rise and run of this tangent line rather than the curve itself. So now it's not going to be an average velocity, um, it's going to be the velocity at 42. So my, average, my velocity v is going to be delta x over delta t, that's for the tangent line. So that's going to be something like 58 for my final, uh, my final position and 1 for my initial. 58 minus 1 over 70 minus 20 will give me 57 over 50, which is about 1.14. Now I've got to be careful with units. That was in kilometers and seconds. That'll be kilometers per second. Now there are a thousand kilometers, a thousand meters in a kilometer, so that will make one thousand one hundred and forty, approximately meters per second. Okay, so that with that idea in mind, the fact that we can work out velocities by drawing a tangent line and taking the slope of that, look at the following graph and see if you can figure out at which point the velocity is the highest in magnitude. So pause the video and figure out an answer before you continue. All right, so hopefully you've had a, go, had a go at that. So if I get my ruler and I kind of try and draw a tangent line at each of those points on the graph, you can see that my graph is actually steepest at C, and so the correct answer is C. That's where the velocity is, is greatest, or highest in magnitude. Okay, so that's velocity. We know that we can get velocity from displacement time graphs um, by taking tangent lines, and we can also get a good estimate by just sort of taking a small interval around and taking an average velocity over that interval. All right, now back to that jet car example though. When we were looking at that one, it had a curved position time graph. So this indicated to us that the velocity was actually changing. And when we have changes in velocity, that's known as acceleration. So the nice thing is we can define acceleration um, from velocity using exactly the same way or the same method that we define velocity from displacement. So the average acceleration over an interval is the change in instantaneous velocity, delta v, divided by the change in time, delta t. So we'd write that as a average is delta v over delta t, which will be vf minus vi over tf minus ti meters per second squared. Okay, the units for, for acceleration are the units for velocity, meters per second, divided by the units for time, seconds. So that gives us meters per second squared, or you can also write it as m times s to the negative two. It means exactly the same thing. Now, just like velocity and displacement, acceleration is a vector quantity, uh, meaning that it's got a magnitude, and it's also got a direction which again, because we're in, one, in 1D, direction is just going to be plus or minus, corresponding to right and left. 
Now just a quick note, most of the time in this course we'll be dealing with uh, scenarios where the acceleration is constant. And so sometimes we'll be a little bit careless and we'll write a when we mean af because in that situation it's the same thing. Um, so just be aware uh, that it, the average versus instantaneous acceleration works just the same way as it does for velocity. So let's return to our moving man demonstration. We're going to try to understand what acceleration means. So remember last time we grabbed our guy and we dragged him around and we could see, we could see the graph move. Now this time we're going to do it a little bit differently. Um, we're going to start our thing off by instead of just grabbing, uh, moving it around and seeing what happens, we're instead going to um, set an initial position, velocity and acceleration, and we're going to see what happens when we press go. So the acceleration will remain constant for the whole time, and we'll what, be able to watch the position and velocity of our moving man change as we do this. So I'm going to set it up with a man at 3 meters to start with, so I can just type that straight in here. And I'll give him a velocity of negative 3 meters per second. So to start with, I'm not going to have any acceleration. I just want to see what happens when I put that in there and I press go. So here we are. Okay, he steadily moves, moves left at a constant velocity of 3. And then he smacks into the wall. Good for him. Or maybe not. Okay, so that's kind of how it works. We can set up our velocity and our position to start with and we can just see what happens. So this time I'm going to give him a positive acceleration. So once again, I'll set him up at three meters. I'll give him a velocity of negative three. And this time I'm going to give him a constant acceleration of one meter per second squared. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom in on my axes a little bit so we can see a bit better. Um, we want to have time uh, zoomed in. So we got one second intervals that's good and I'm just going to make my um, velocity go between negative 6 and 6 just so you can see a bit better okay so we should see let's just see what happens when we now make this guy go so I hit record he's moving left but notice he's slowing down and then he turns around and he's accelerating until once again he smacks into the wall so that was interesting so he started at a position of 3 he was a little, his acceleration was one for the whole time. Uh, again, let's zoom in on this graph so you can actually see that. Um, but what happened was he, his position was decreasing as we'd expect because his velocity was negative. But eventually he slowed down to a stop at about, what's that, three seconds. And you can see his velocity graph. Again, that started at negative three. Um, and gradually is creeping up by one every second. That's because the acceleration is one meter per second squared. So as this velocity creeps up, um, that initially that corresponds to him slowing down because he's initially moving left. His velocity increasing is meaning that negative number is heading towards zero. But then the velocity keeps increasing after that point and starts becoming positive. And as it becomes more and more positive, it goes and goes and goes and goes and eventually he speeds up and smacks into the wall. Okay so let's um, just make a quick note there. So a positive acceleration does not mean that you are necessarily moving right. Uh, what it means is that your velocity is increasing or becoming more positive. So that means if you start off with a negative velocity you do initially move left but you slow down and then you ex eventually accelerate off to the right. Okay, we could reverse the whole thing if we want very quickly. So we could instead start at, at a position of negative three meters. We could start with a velocity of positive three meters per second. Uh, and we'll give it an acceleration of negative one this time. And we should see the exact thing play out in reverse. So this time it should go right, eventually turn around and then accelerate off to, into the left hand wall. So let's just see what happens. And sure enough, it's doing exactly what we kind of expected. The shapes are exactly the same, they're just reflected from what they were before. Okay, so a couple of little things. Um, we can recognize negative acceleration, or let's do the positive again first. Let's run that again. Okay, so first off, one way you can recognize positive acceleration is a positive slope on the velocity time graph. You can also see it on the displacement graph too, um, because it's curved upwards. And I like to think of this as a happy graph. It's like a smiley face, you could put some eyes up here. And whenever your graph is curved upwards, it means you've got positive acceleration going on. 
And if you have negative acceleration, uh, we find that it works the other way around. So if I record that one, again, just like we did before, when there's negative acceleration present, you can see a negative slope on the velocity time graph, and you can also see negative curvature or concave downness or a sad graph for our position time. Okay, it's sort of like a, a smiley face downwards this time. Um, so you can always, curve, curving downwards corresponds to negative acceleration, curving upwards corresponds to positive. Okay, so just like we did for velocity and displacement, we can work out the acceleration as the slope of the velocity time graph. So let's just start with a quick example. Um, we've got a simple acceleration where we've got two data points, initial time of zero, final time of 10, and our velocity starts at negative four and finishes at negative 24. So if we want to calculate the average acceleration, then that will be delta V over delta T, which will be VF minus VI, all divided by TF minus TI, so negative 24 minus negative four over 10 minus zero, which gives us negative two meters per second squared. Okay, now let's look at a slightly more tricky situation where we have a changing acceleration. Now remember I said most of the time we're not gonna be dealing with changing acceleration, but here's an example where we are. So here's the velocity time, not displacement time. Now it's velocity versus time, graph of a jet car again. And we want to know its acceleration at 30 seconds. So once again, we'll try and draw on a tangent line, make it nice and big so we can hopefully get a decent estimate, and we'll instant estimate our instantaneous acceleration, i.e. that's the acceleration at the moment 30 seconds, uh, by working out the rise of a run for that triangle that we just built. So our acceleration will be change in velocity over change in time for the tangent line. So it'll be 260 minus 210, which is about, divided by about 49.5 minus zero which will give us about 1.01 .01 meters per second squared. Okay, so last off, let's just take a look at this picture which shows velocity time graphs of two different motions. So the question that you wanna ask yourself is at what point in time are the two accelerations equal? So this is, these are velocity time graphs. Um, so our options are one second, option A, 2.5 seconds, option B, uh, option C is four seconds, D is five seconds, E is 6.5 seconds, and F is none of the above. So pause the video, see if you can figure out which is the right answer before you continue. And hopefully what you found was that the right answer is B. We have a velocity time graph. This means the acceleration is the slope of those curves, and the slopes look about equal at 2.5. Um, subject to my bad drawing at any rate. So that's gonna be our answer. At zero and near five, the, veloc the velocities are the same, but not the accelerations, because the accelerations are the slopes. Now you know what acceleration is. It's defined as changes in velocity over time, and we saw that the calculations we do are just the same as we did for getting velocities from displacements. So it's a little bit harder to get your head around, because you can have things like positive accelerations while things are moving left, um, but the moving man simulation is a really good resource to practice your intuition on these things because you can set up any scenario you want, press go and test that you understand how it works correctly. Okay, so your next job is to going to be to work on some problems in our next workshop and we'll see you then. Kakite anō.